Real questions, real answers for real life. Come on in and pull up a chair. You're at 1850 Main Street with Michael Del Giorno and David Zanotti. The big question is on the table today. How do you stop a civil war? Can you stop it? So this conversation, um, hmm, I wonder how it'll turn out. I don't know. It, it, it's it's complicated. It's multiple layers, and it represents, heaven knows, such obvious conclusions that you could take 40 to 50 years to actually get to. Yeah. And then you get to them and go, duh, that was pretty simple. Or the last time we visited, we had real data to show the movement. Here, this is all thoughts and, and trajectory and, and, and yeah and history really to guide so the future there's been all this suddenly the civil war according to the washington post the civil war is now one of the hottest conversations in the presidential election oh how interesting i, <laughs> I wonder when you have a president and an incumbent president running around the country talking about the end of democracy as we know it and likening all kinds of military battles and 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 and, and dictators and wars you think People are going to start thinking civil war. I, I Maybe, just maybe, with the unibrow, uniparty media basically telling us all what reality is, and it's all that's going to be the civil war. Let's talk about civil war. Donald Trump said something recently that, it's, that he's gotten a lot of criticism for. It's an interesting point. Sounds like he was golfing with us. Yeah. Historians talk about it constantly. Could we have negotiated the way out of a civil war? Hmm. Kind of sounds like 1850 Main Street. Yeah. If you were 10 years well, we're out. we're trying right now. <laughs> and you knew a civil war was likely, what would you do to keep it from happening? Because there's nothing as bad as a civil war. By the way, we've talked about that several times as to why we came up with the name 1850, because that's roughly 10 years prior to the civil war. Mm -hmm. And what could they have done to keep the civil war from happening? And if we're that close again, what can we do in the next year, 10 years to avoid the unthinkable, another civil war? I never could. Were you able to? Well, let's go back and look at the history. There were plenty of attempts to compromise uh, and, and keep the country from splitting and secession from happening and going to war. Plenty of opportunities where Congress got to, but they were happening in Congress. Remember, all of this was happening in Congress. The Missouri Compromise, uh, the, the whole concept of, of bloody Kansas, the question of, of how are we going to put a line out there that says, as the country expands and new states come on, which one will be slaves? Which one will be free? What was all of that all about? These, these, you know, Henry Clay and all the work that he did, what were all these prior legislative compromises about? They were designed to try to keep a sense of fairness and balance in the Congress so that neither side that disagreed on, this, on the issue of slavery would feel that they were being eliminated from the fight and, in essence, Either slavery or abolition would simply be automatic because Congress would have such a predominance of abolitionists or slavers that you couldn't make any change. It would end the debate because the numbers had changed based on population. Or remember, every state that comes on has two Senate votes. Right. So population doesn't matter. It's the establishment of a state. This was what the war was all about before the war broke out. Yeah, I think the bigger question is... Um but how could they both do that under the same Declaration of Independence and the same Constitution? Well, that's a brilliant way of articulating that question. So you can't. Otherwise, the simplest thing would have been, okay, these are the United Free States of America. These are the United Slavery States of America. But if what unites them is the Constitution and the Declaration of Ind Independence, that United Slavery States of America, they got a problem with their own identity. And here's, uh, here's something that smacks right into the 1619 and, uh, agenda. And, and it just, it, it, and, and critical race theory. People will condemn the United States Constitution in the name of preserving uh, justice and equity for black Americans by saying that racist, bigoted Constitution only counted black people as three fifths people because they were slaves. Um, excuse me. And they go, you see how insulting those white people were, those white aristocrats? or how smart they were because the non-slave states and the non-slave founders who had a dominant interest in these documents being correctly put together placed inside that a trap door. 
since the South was going to have slavery and the North didn't want slavery from the very beginning, then here's the deal. We're going to have a representative uh, a, a form of government and the census will count. But as long as you have slaves, we recognize that they're people. We recognize that they're created equal by God. As long as you're going to put them in a less than that position, then you only get three-fifths credit for them in the census. So guess what? Our votes are always going to be heavier than your votes. A free vote will always be heavier than a slave vote. Hmm. And without that, would they have been, as they rightfully should have been from day one, a full person sooner or later? In other words, well, that was a powerful way of... Exactly. We people forget in the original constitution, we in essence outlawed the slave trade. And there was white guys uh, that did that for them, 30 right? Thirty years. It, yeah, it was <laughs> it was and, and let's remember John Adams and his family never owned slaves. And they were the John and Sam Adams were very, very huge thinkers in regards to this process. So and the, we're talking about Massachusetts and the Bay Area versus Virginia and the South. And so this was a very sophisticated, very thoughtful process that was put into place. Now, the reason that they just didn't write one big uh, document with one brush and say, it's it's this way or the highway is because it would have been the highway and they never would have become a free country. It was tough enough to defend themselves as 13 colonies if they had split right down the middle and been six and six. All right, they would have been they would have been eaten alive by the by the foreign powers. So there were things that they had to put in sequential order to get the ultimate goal of liberty and justice for all. And you say, well, that's not fair. They should have done it right the first time. Excuse me. These people were coming out of a thousand years yeah. of darkness from the end of the Roman Empire, the Middle Ages, and the feudal era of the monarchies. You think they're going to be able in one day to fix the whole thing? Their shot percentage was pretty good, if you ask me. All right, so yeah, and they didn't have the internet. So Trump being criticized. By the way, I might add, by both the left and the right, for something that is the most historically in context and correct, which had had my friend saying things like, I think Donald Trump is reading now. Uh, but <laughs> let me go back to the big question of this Washington Post piece. Is the major component of this pr presidential election race slavery? Why didn't they use the word insurrection? Well, let's go to what the Post is trying to tell us that, that you know, we... Um, well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to, to um, incite the 1619 critical race theory crowd because they've sort of been displaced in shelf life and in space, in, 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 uh, in, in shelf space, if you will, because uh, so many other issues have come out now to, into the realm of left-wing outrage. You haven't heard the word critical race theory in the media for months. No, that's a losing expression, and it was a losing agenda that went too far and awoke Awakened parents. The truth, the truth caught up with them. It caught up with them. All right. So that was kind of my gut. And I wanted, like we talk about if we weren't in the golf cart right now and somebody wasn't listening to us, what would I ask you? I'd say, I smelled a rat reading this Washington Post article that this is more of a response to the loss of the black voting bloc than it really is their interest in what's brewing underneath the main headlines of this election cycle. Did it strike you that way? Well, they're running out of narratives and they're turning the pages really fast. And they're trying to figure out what does it take to hit the nerve that motivates a voting block, regardless of reason or history. This is the, and, and so, so suddenly the, um, the, the, the question of the civil war has become chic. And now we're all going to talk about what really caused the civil war. Well, there's a lot of things. That, you talk about something enough, it might happen. You could make and if, of course, slavery was the, hub of the entire conversation. But if you want to talk about the causes of the Civil War, slavery had been around for a while. Slavery in and of itself wasn't the only thing that caused it to happen. What caused it to happen was, and again, slavery is the hub. It's, it's, it's the key, okay? But there are spokes that come off of that. One of the things that caused it to happen was the belief in the Southern states because of geography, as in there was no air conditioning, because of the ability to expand population, because how many people do you need on a plantation where all the labor comes from slaves? Furthermore, you have giant land tracts because you're not going to have housing developments because you're growing cotton and cotton is king in the international economy right now and they're making money hand over fist. But population is king if you're talking politics and control. But they can't get to population because all the people that they're breeding for population only counts as three-fifths anyhow. 
And the rest are dying at disproportionate amounts of disease, right? And they are being surrounded by the abolition thought, the thought of the abolition of slavery. Then it gets worse. Now, if we're going to expand into new territories and new countries, we've got to bring in one for the other. You've got to you've got to have slave and free balanced out. Congress is fighting for that. Guess what? They are seeing they will be a permanent and perpetual minority, which means eventually by statute, Congress is going to eliminate their slave business. So they see the handwriting on the wall. They realize all the structures of accountability and separation of powers have been set against them. And suddenly the roof's falling in. Then what happens? 1860, our show's 1850, 10 years. 1860, along comes a new political party. Abraham Lincoln is the second person to run for the White House. General Fremont was first. Second person who runs for the White House. This guy who's surely got to be a loser. This spindly guy from Kentucky who, uh, you know, he, he was a member of, of the House of Representatives for two years. I mean, who this guy's, a, you know where he got his law degree? He got his law degree out of a barrel of books, that he, law books that were handed to him when he was a, sh- a shopkeeper. He read the books and passed the bar. This guy is nobody. And he runs and does not get one single electoral vote from the South. He gets them all from the North and becomes president of the United States. And suddenly the handwriting on the wall is red in blood. They realize they're done. They're finished. They're finished. They they called Lincoln a black Republican. That's what they called him. And they realized that the system, they could never prevail. So they left. They didn't attack Washington, D.C. They left and said, our only hope to preserve our institutions, including the most despicable ever created in slavery, was to start their own country. That was why it happened. Now, think about that in light of what we've been talking about, about population moving, electoral votes shifting now from blue states to red states, And suddenly the trend going against the progressives, that's why in their desperation, they want to do things that to to basically change the structures of government because they're losing. It's halftime here at 1850 Main Street. Time to freshen up that cup of coffee. You can start every morning off right by listening to your morning show with Michael Del Giorno. Tune in to stations across America and online at the free iHeart mobile app. Get a head start on the big stories of the day every day with your morning show on the iHeart Network. So if the left all those years ago, when they were in checkmate, chose to leave, which led to civil war. If there is aware of what we've just stated in our last two conversations, what do they do this time? That's a great question. Because that's what puts civil, you know, one of the things that we've talked about, I don't think it's, I don't, I'd get more emails and I know, you know, we, one of the things, you know, if, if you do something through the internet, it's not like wondering if Arbitron or Nielsen was accurate. You know, who's listening. You see them, you can count them, but I don't think they've connected the dots yet. When we were talking very specifically, when we did the time magazine, February 15th edition, 2021, a shadow campaign to save the democracy, the shadow campaign for democracy, right? That was the left telling you, we're going to bend some rules. We're going to weaponize COVID. We're going to change election laws unconstitutionally. Wasn't done in software systems and algorithms. They were shifting votes to mail in and harvesting those votes. They went out and bought them states. fair and square. They bought them fair and square. All right. But also in that manifesto, and this didn't get by you, it got by me, was the section where they had a planned insurrection. Yeah. The Democrats, had Donald Trump beat Joe Biden, they were going to carry out the insurrection. And we know that because they said there was kind of a shock. We couldn't believe it. We pulled it off. And the first thing they had to do was call down all their operatives they had lined up to create an insurrection. Now, think about that, because in a matter of weeks, they're going to set a trap at the Capitol that Donald Trump was dumb enough to speak 
uh, recklessly and some bad players and those following them were dumb enough to walk into the Capitol and they made the right, the big insurrectionists. But I would tell you, never mind the lessons of 1860s. You in 2020 can see they plan when they're in checkmate to insurrect for real. And why? Because Francis Schaeffer said this in, in the 1980s. When the sociological law people, in other words, the people who don't believe in absolute truth, who don't believe in the Constitution, don't believe in the Declaration, who make it up as they go along because they want power, when they see they can't get power, will create chaos, will create anarchy, because human societies cannot live in anarchy. And if they can create the anarchy, then they can create the takeover control situation where they can subjugate their opponents. I give you covid as an example. But I also give you a second example in recent history. After January 6th, look at what happened in Washington, D.C. for months afterwards. Fences were put up. Armed guards were everywhere. The United States military was mobilized against our own people. And you couldn't move anywhere where the government told you you couldn't go to in Washington, D.C., I might add, Homeland Security has been weaponized primarily more against people than it has been outside threats. Of course. The Justice Department has very recently become very mobilized against its own people. This is not hysterical conspiracy talk. This is in plain sight. Well, the conversation, the name of of, of the podcast, 1850mainstreet.com. I added, and that's when the light bulb went off. We started you with 1850 and that question on the golf cart. Then I added Main Street because this is a place and time. So I gave it a place and address and went, yeah, that's the name. 1850 Main Street. Mm -hmm. What is 1850 Main Street? It's 1850. How do you keep from having a civil war? Oh, while you're busy having that conversation and good luck, um, it's now 2024. And the way I see it, those three representative cycles of two years, add six years to 2024, uh, it's 2030. So are we some 10 years out? from a a potential second civil war. Well, my question for you is, I mean, there are differences. Uh, Sovereignty versus open borders. Uh, Life versus abortion. Uh, Cops are bad. Bad guys are good. You're not going to find any negotiated common ground here. How does this not end in a civil war again? Yeah, well, the one thing about our Declaration of Independence is that it's built upon a a principle that goes back thousands of years. That principle is the consent of the governed. Ultimately, you cannot win a civil war because the only way you can govern is by consent. You will, until people decide they are willing to abide in agreement in civil government, you have no government, you have chaos, you have totalitarianism, you have a dictatorship. Now, right now, There is, there clearly, we have seen it over and again, there is an authoritarian element in the progressive movement. It doesn't matter whether they're Republicans or Democrat. Mike DeWine was every bit as much a dictator in Ohio as any dictator has ever been in this country during the time of COVID. And he's a Republican and supposedly a conservative. Now, that kind of stuff happens. Uh, Bill Lee was not far behind in Tennessee. People can lose their minds and move to authoritarianism. This stuff happens. So we are in a a very dangerous situation, except for one factor. The ideas of the left don't work. The COVID authoritarianism was not sustainable. The facts caught up with them. Every time the facts catch up with the totalitarians, they lose because all they're about is the power. They're not about righteousness. They're not about justice. They're not about preserving the rights of the minority. They're about being, now they may think they're nobly motivated for power, but in the end, you can only govern people that will to be governed. And that means either you kill all the ones who don't agree or you come up with some form of a compromise. We started this conversation over three stories that the media didn't collaborate. We're putting one plus one plus one together because we couldn't believe they came out in the same week and paint such a clear, vivid picture that you probably haven't pieced together yet. One is, thank God, uh, the generation we've criticized the most, the millennials, and the ones we think are the first to be raised by the internet and smartphones and dumbed down. They're the first two to wake up. 
and prove once and for all that it's unaffordable as a worldview, policy view, and a utopian agenda. And they're, they're out moving. of here. They're, they're gone. <laughs> they're moving. <laughs> they've left blue states to go to red states, and they've done it in such numbers, 250,000 uh, just in the year 2022 alone, that that led to our second story, census projections that six years from now, three more House of Representative two-year terms from now, there'll be 14 congressional seats gained by Republicans lost by Democrats and 14 delegates gained by Republicans on an electoral college map. Well, that's why they're pushing for ranked voting, eliminating the electoral college, and maybe even splitting states because they're in checkmate. And so what's their next move? That brings us back to 1850 that we named the show after. And in 1850, they saw the writing on the wall with Lincoln's election. That was it. They were going to leave. That led to war. So was that slavery or slavery is a hub with many spokes? What's our hub today and what are our spokes today and how much time do we have? Oh, uh, you know, that's the question. I'm not going to even try to answer in regards to how much time do we have, because that has to do with a lot of people in power making certain choices. I would say anyone who wonders how close we are, read that Time Magazine article. Just read it for yourself. The Shadow Campaign to Save Democracy. Can I say it this way? Yeah. Shadow Campaign to Save Democracy, February 15th, 2021, uh, Time Magazine. To the question of how close are we, start with what you just said, how close we were just three years ago. Two closing thoughts to remember. One is the ideas of the progressive left are out of touch with the created order of reality as humans have known it for thousands of years. They don't work. So you can outlast them if you can survive. Secondly, it depends upon how willing people are to unite together based on first principles and through the positive activities of doing what works, overcome the evil and the darkness. And then the third most important thing is people shouldn't panic. Because if you read the Declaration of Independence, it reminds us there is a creator who still cares about his creation. And the people who fear God and try to do the right thing will prevail. That's the point. And it doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter their country of origin. It doesn't matter their socioeconomic status. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that, to me, is where we have to start. Did you know that you can hear Michael and David every day on your morning show on the iHeartRadio network? You can tune in daily or log on live to the free iHeartMobile app. Get a head start on the big stories of the day every day on your morning show. Then join us here where the conversation continues. Subscribe today so you don't miss a minute and visit 1850MainStreet.com to find out more. We'll see you next time here at 1850 Main Street.